Good morning, Word of Life. It is great to be able to come and be with you. Welcome to everyone that's part of Church Online this morning. Uh, if you saw that video, um, I don't know who that guy in the beard was. Um, if ever you're wondering why I don't have a beard anymore, let's just say I lost my voting rights on my wedding day. <laughs> we'll leave it there. But as we turn the video, we have Life Path coming up. Life Path is, um, you know, sort of the bearded guy and the lovely lady on the video we're talking about. It's a great opportunity for you to hear all about the church, hopefully get a sense of confidence. This is a great church for you and your family to belong, be a part of, and that'll help you grow in your relationship with God and give a chance for you to see all the good stuff that's going on. So hopefully you're a part of that. But we are obsessed here at the church, and obsessed is the right word with people taking next steps. Uh, and part of this is just the, the wiring of Megan and I, is that no matter what else we may celebrate, no matter what other good stuff there is, what will always drive us and emotionally move us is people taking next steps. So we saw some videos uh, of kids going through baptism, and it was awesome, because uh, two of the kids featured were our kids, which are awesome, the twins, which is really cool. But uh, baptism is one of my favorite things, to be able to be there for somebody as they are taking that brave step of saying publicly, this is it, I'm following Jesus, I'm putting him in the central spot in my life. He is the Lord and Savior, and I'm moving on in my relationship with Him. I love baptisms. This past Wednesday, there were 14 people that went through water baptism. Can we please celebrate 14 people making that next step? This is amazing. Amazing news, and uh, so there's all sorts of good stuff that's happening at the church. Some of it you may be aware of, some of it is happening in uh, different pockets and different places where you might not be aware of all the good stuff that's going on. So next weekend, uh, we're going to have, I don't want to say a special weekend, because I don't know if that's necessarily an accurate descriptor, but as part of the message, I want to share some of the good stuff that's been going on. You may already remember, and it may have already occurred to you, next Sunday, which is Memorial Day weekend, it is one year since Pastor Randy got on a motorcycle and tore off out of here. And it was that Sunday where not only was Pastor Randy and Marianne honored, respected, we thanked them, we loved them for the years that they poured into this church and this community, and we sent them off into retirement, wishing them all the very best, but it was also the Sunday where Megan and I were prayed in as the lead pastors at the church, and so somewhat of a year anniversary we want to do, um, for want of a better expression, a state of the union. So I want to look at some of the different ways that we're seeing God move and let everyone know this is some of the great stuff that we're seeing. So that's happening next week. Does that sound like a plan? But as I say, we're obsessed with next steps. We're obsessed with people progressing in their faith and, and moving forward and growing deeper in their relationship with God. And I think that that is uh, the, the right response. I think this is right that we should be obsessed with this. A life of faith isn't static. A life of faith, a life following God, it, it's progressing, it's deepening. I hope for myself as a Christian that this time next year, I want to be closer to God. I want to be stronger in my relationship with Him. I hope that this time next year, I can look back and, and I can see that God has transformed my heart that he's built a greater love for people in my heart, that he's built character, he's built integrity in my heart in a greater way than it is right now. I want to see God move in my life. I don't want to just have my faith be one single moment, and then that one single moment hopefully has a big impact on me. I want my life of faith to be progressing and ongoing. I want to continue learning more and more about God and growing in my love and appreciation for him. If this is our approach, and I believe this is the approach that I want for myself, and I believe it's right for all of us, is to have this idea of faith as being something that is progressing, and there's momentum, and there's movement. What comes with that is that there are seasons. There's times of testing. There's times of difficulty. There's also times of promotion and times of blessing. There's times of stretching. And to help us navigate this idea of this life of faith as it being, you know, a progressive and movement, and there being forward motion, there being seasons, some up, some downs. Some difficult, some are absolute breeze, and some an absolute joy. In all of that, we are, of course, given the Bible, and specifically within the Bible, we're given biblical heroes. And we're given biblical heroes so that we can read about their lives and their experiences and how God moved in their life, how God helped them navigate the different seasons so that we can look and we can read and we can take encouragement and insight for ourselves. Now, oftentimes, the biblical heroes, they're worse than the average person. Jesus, of course, is the hero of the Bible, and the whole Bible points to him, and he is perfect, that's of course. But others aren't presented as flawless. David has an affair and then plans the death of the woman's husband. Paul is involved in the arrest and the death of the first Christians. Moses kills someone, then ran away and hid. Peter cuts off somebody's ear. We had a professor in Bible college who made the case that in the whole of the Old Testament, the only protagonists who were truly heroic were possibly Joseph and maybe Daniel. Other than that, everyone else is a deeply flawed person that we're presented with as these are people to look to and learn from about what it means to live a life of faith. Despite their imperfections, 
We're given these people, we are shown these individuals to help us learn what it means to follow God. Not necessarily to blindly copy what they do, but rather to observe something about God, life, our own existence, living with each other. As we read about their lives, we can see what it's like to navigate the seasons of life and progress in the promises of God. We can see from the biblical heroes what a deepening relationship with God looks like. What it might look like for God's plans to unfold in someone's life is how he moves them in the different seasons of life. And of all the biblical heroes we could look at, I want to spend some time today and talk about Jacob. Now, Jacob in the Old Testament, you'll find Jacob in the book of Genesis. Jacob is the grandchild of Abraham. Now, Abraham is a key figure in the Bible. It was to Abraham that God came and said, I am going to do something miraculous and incredible through you. It was Abraham that received the promise. It was Abraham that made the covenant. And Abraham was promised that his children, he was promised by God that his children would become a nation, a special nation, a nation set apart by God to do something unique on the planet. And Abraham, tragically, he tried to generate the fulfillment of that promise with a female slave. And this was before um, Isaac was miraculously born. Isaac, the son of Abraham, he appears to have learned the lesson from his dad and how that all worked out. And he prayed for the promise to be continued and fulfilled through him. Isaac prays for a child and he has twins. Megan and I know something about this. We too have a buy one, get one free situation in our house. But while Isaac's wife was pregnant with the twins... They're told that they struggled in her womb. I asked Megan, and she confirmed that this feeling of babies struggling in the womb is very real. But God told Rebecca, Isaac's wife, that these two boys, they would grow up to be rivals, and even that their descendants would become two nations. The older son would serve the younger son. Now, I'm the youngest of two sons, and this sounds perfectly acceptable to me. But in ancient culture, this was unheard of. The oldest sons were the ones that were the heirs to the estate, they were the heirs to the father and all the property. And Jacob is born second, and he's literally grabbing the heel of his brother as he's born. He's grabbing the heel of Esau, his twin brother. And this begins his life of supplanting, of deception, of trying to manipulate, of trying to grab things that aren't his, of trying to get ahead in life, by being a dishonest person, by being a trickster. As we then progress through Jacob's life, we see as he grows up, he cons his brother out of his inheritance. There's a bowl of lentil soup. Esau's hungry. I'll give you the soup if you promise that you'll give me the inheritance. This is the worst deal of all time. It wasn't even good soup. It was stinking gross lentil soup. Who on earth cares about that? But for that, he conned his brother out of his inheritance. Later on, we see he also played a similar trick, and this time he involved his mom, and mom was in cahoots and manipulating dad and deceiving dad, and he conned his brother out of, out of his blessing from his father. Now, the blessing, this isn't something that would be customary for us today, but a blessing in this period, this is essentially a transfer of leadership. The father knows that his time is coming close to his passing. And so he prays for the oldest son and prays that the leadership of the family or the clan will transfer to this one. And Jacob conspires with mom and this whole charade, uh, basically to engineer so that he gets that blessing. It's pronounced to him that this is the one that will be in charge. Now, I believe that this is done publicly, which is why this is a big deal. It's done publicly that this is the one that's now in charge, but it also gives explanation about why there's no take-backs when the truth becomes uh, becomes revealed. The blessing was given to this one. It has to stand. And after this, after being conned out of his inheritance, after being conned out of his blessing and the position of leadership and authority within the family and within the clan, Esau swears revenge on his brother. Consequently, Jacob runs away. And as he's running away, he comes to a place and he lays his head down and he has a vision of a stairway to heaven. Now, it's important to know that Stairway to Heaven originated in the Bible, not Led Zeppelin. (laughs) And it's in this vision that God reconfirms the promise to Jacob that you will see great things, that I will fulfill my plans. My promises still stand with you. I am with you. Jacob progresses. He goes on, and he catches up with an uncle of his called Laban. And he works with Laban, and as he's there, he sort of catches the eye of one of his daughters and falls in love with the youngest daughter. So he works out a deal with Laban to marry the youngest daughter, but when it's time for the wedding, there's a whole other charade. And this time, Laban tricks the trickster. The con artist gets conned as he turns out on the morning after the wedding that he's actually married the wrong daughter. So he strikes another deal with Laban so that this time he can marry the one he's actually in love with. So now he ends up with two wives. And as you can imagine, the drama that ensues from this is ridiculous. 
The drama that comes from this is absolutely wild. All the things that happen because he sort of gets involved in this very complicated marriage. It also involves some terrible stuff involving handmaidens. It's terrible to read, and it's shocking to read, and it should be shocking to read. But at this point in Jacob's life, he has 11 sons. He goes on to have a 12th son. He also has a daughter. He's become wealthy. He's prosperous. And his relationship with Laban goes bad. So he makes the decision that he's going to return back home. So he packs up, runs away. Laban catches up with Jacob. He's furious that he's left. They make peace together. They reconcile. There's forgiveness. Then progresses towards home. Progresses towards home. He now needs to make amends with Esau. Esau's vowed to kill him. So he sends some gifts. He tries to reconcile. And sure enough, they get together. And a painful reconciliation happens. And as Jacob begins living in peace, he settled his differences with his brother. He settled his differences with Laban. He starts living in peace. His children, they start causing drama. His daughter Dinah is attacked and then violently avenged by some of her brothers. The sons object to their father showing favoritism to their brother Joseph. Jacob believes that his favorite son, Joseph, is killed by a wild animal. Years later, during a famine, his sons go to buy food from Egypt, only to discover that his favorite son, Joseph, is still alive years later, and he's been promoted to the second in command over all of Egypt. The whole family relocates to Egypt. They make peace. They reconcile. Jacob moves to Egypt, where he spends his final years, and he dies at the age of 147, highly respected and honored. Now, the story of Jacob is firstly another reminder that God is faithful to his promises, but it's also an example of someone who started with potential, but threw it all away, only to do a course correction and finish strong. And we think about it in in this sense, Jacob started life good. He's a promised child. He's a child of promise. He's Abraham's grandson. Abraham was promised God is going to do great things for you. He started good, very quickly started to go bad. Grabbed the heel, and it was downhill from there. Conned his brother out of his inheritance. Conned his brother out of his blessing. Ran away. Meets Laban. Has problems. Has drama. The problem continues. He decides enough is enough. It's time to reconcile. And he starts climbing out of the slump. Makes peace with Laban. Makes peace with Esau. Ends up in Egypt. Dies at a right old age, honored and respected. Seeing the promises of God being fulfilled through his children's lives. Starts good. Big descent, time at the bottom, climbs out. That is the chart of Jacob's life. And there's a moment in the life of Jacob that we haven't hit on yet that I want to. In the middle of this guy who was born with promise, and he quickly descended into the depths of crazy, but he clawed his way out. God helped get him out of that, broke the cycle, and he ended strong. And the moment I want to hit on today is Jacob wrestling with God. It's a well-known story. Some of you all know it well. Just this morning, I was on Instagram and I saw some memes about this. We're going to be in Genesis 32. Words are on the screen if you don't have a Bible. If you want to follow along, feel free. Genesis 32, starting in verse 22. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. Now, this is a strange story. This is an odd, you know, an odd series of events. A mysterious individual comes wrestles with Jacob for no apparent reason. We've no idea where he came from. We've no idea why he was there. Hosea later on would describe this individual as an angel. The individual refuses to say his name to Jacob. Now, obviously, it's not a regular person. And Jacob was so astounded by the individual that he renamed the place to describe his encounter as seeing God face to face. 
And Jacob wrestles with this character all night long. The man touches and dislocates Jacob's hip. Now in the Hebrew, I looked this up this week because I was curious, it doesn't say he got punched in the hip. It doesn't say he got whacked in the hip. It says he got touched. Just a touch was enough to dislocate this hip. And then Jacob demands a blessing. Jacob persists, keeps wrestling until he receives a blessing. Despite how strange this is, despite having fought all night, despite the dislocated hip, despite the individual saying, let me go. And the first thing that occurred to me is possibly the most obvious, is you win because you don't give up. You win because you don't give up. Persistence is an underrated quality, a determination and a resolve to just keep going. And at this moment, it happens at an interesting time in, in Jacob's life. And if we think back to this chart that we could map out of Jacob's life, he's already descended. He's come down. He's already conned his brother out of his birthright, out of his blessing. He's run away. He's on the run. He's at his moment uh, with the stairway to heaven. Now he meets up with Laban. Everything goes bad. He's still there. And he decides it's time to get back on track. It's time to get back to the promises. It's time for me to leave Laban leave what I've known for the past 20 some years, and it's time for me to get home and resume my place, seeing the promises of God unfold in my life. I'm going back home. And he starts to come out of the slump, and it's at that point that this individual turns up and wrestles with Jacob all night long so that Jacob can get a blessing. This is where persistence is shown. It's when he's come down, he's descended, he's come down into the depths, and he starts to creep out, and then, then Jacob has this moment where he has to persist. He has to resolve. No, I'm not letting go. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep going until I get a blessing. Now, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that God always does something. But one thing that I do want to put to you is that the wrestle is often the preparation that precedes a promotion. The wrestle is often the preparation that precedes a promotion. I'm hesitant to say always, But there is a pattern that we can see in the Bible. Paul was in Arabia for three years alone, immediately following his conversion before he started preaching. Three years of wrestling. Joseph, Jacob's son, was in prison for something he didn't do before becoming second in command in Egypt. David was on the run waiting to be king before the death of King Saul. Moses fasted 40 days while God wrote the Ten Commandments, wrestling. Elijah fasted and wrestled for 40 days in preparation for God to speak to him about being sent to anoint two different kings and then to anoint Elisha to be his replacement. Queen Esther had to courageously approach the king to save the Jewish people in Persia. The wrestle is often the preparation that precedes a promotion. We see it in Paul, we see it in Joseph, we see it in David, Moses, Elijah, and Esther, and others. The wrestle is often the preparation that precedes a promotion. And this wrestle... It wasn't Jacob suffering the consequences of his sin. It's important to note that here. There are seasons we go through in life. There's difficulties we go through in life. And it is the consequence of our own decisions, of our own making. It's difficult. It's terrible. I'm glad God's grace is there. But that's not what we're talking about today. The wrestle that Jacob was up against, David being on the run in the wilderness, Moses spending 40 days fasting, Elijah 40 days fasting, Esther having to get the courage together to speak to the king. These wrestles weren't a consequence of their sin and a consequence of their decision. These are people who found themselves in a difficult season through no fault of their own. This is a time when stretching happens, where building happens, strengthening is happening, preparing is happening. A New Testament passage that speaks to this is in Romans, Romans 5, starting verse 3. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. We can rejoice too when it's time to wrestle. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Problems and trials equals endurance. Strong character, strong hope in Jesus. That's what comes from seasons of wrestling. Now, Jacob's wrestle, interesting. There's a lot in here. And it came as an interesting time. There's a lot of interesting details in this. First thing worth noting is that he'd started reconciliation. He'd started to climb out of the slump. He'd made peace with Laman. He's on his way to make peace with Esau. It happened alone. 
It happened at night. And then he realizes that his hip has been knocked out of whack. And I don't know about you, but that's a humbling experience. I've had an experience of my own in this. It's probably not as dramatic as getting my hip knocked out of its socket by an individual that just wants to wrestle for the sake of wrestling, apparently. But when I lived in New York City, Meg and I, we were part of a church, and uh, I was there early to set up, and there was a piece of cardboard on the floor, and then my other foot was on, on the floor, so cardboard, floor, and as I'm down, I make the mistake of bending down, and the cardboard slips. And so my leg just kind of did that, and next thing I know, my kneecap is round here. Now, I am no doctor, but kneecaps are not supposed to be there. It went back in place, I kind of sat down, and then there was a, a young lady who was in our, um, our small group, and she was pre-med, and so she kind of sat down and kind of had a look and made sure I was all good, and basically told me, if you go to urgent care, you're going to be there for four hours, basically you just need to go home, ice it up, and do this, that, and the other, right? So now, I need to get home with a busted up leg, the only thing I can do is have Megan help me. Just for fun, Megan is seven or eight months pregnant at the time. So if you can imagine, Megan's also about you know, 10 inches shorter than I am, and so if you can picture Megan and I, me, just leaning heavily on her, she's crazy pregnant, hobbling down the steps of the Union Square subway station to get home. That's the visual. I don't know about you, but that's humbling. Trust me, it's humbling. You get strange looks when you're leaning on your pregnant wife to support you and keep you upright. <laughs> there are things I can't do now. I've got to be careful of this leg. I'm not as quick as I once was, and I never was really that quick, so I'm really slow now. <laughs> There's some physical activities that I have to say no to because once you've popped your knee out of whack, it's really easy for it to get back out of whack. It can be humbling. It can be humbling. But being humbled often precedes promotion. Humility is prevalent throughout the Bible for preceding promotion. Let me rattle off a few verses for you. All of these echo the same sentiment. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Psalm 147, the Lord supports the humble, but he brings the wicked into the dust. 1 Peter 5, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Matthew 23, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Psalm 113, he lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. Luke 1, he has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. Endurance and humility are underrated. They're underrated. They're not valued as other qualities. As we think about life and thinking about, you know, this idea about being promotion, stepping into something new, do we really hold up humility and endurance the way that this example from Jacob is? Do we really take this as seriously as the Bible would have us take it? That endurance and humility, these are underrated qualities in our culture. Now, typically, uh, I'm a sports fan, especially the Premier League soccer. Today's the last game of the season. The best my team can hope to finish is third. I don't want to talk about Liverpool and Man City. That's not why you came to church today. But typically sports is who can get the most points or who can do something the quickest. But there are other things where you can look at a challenge and you can look at a victory as measured in endurance. For instance, my kids, um, they recently introduced me, the twins introduced me to a YouTuber called Mr. Beast. Anybody know who Mr. Beast is? All right, you're under the age of 30, okay. So the twins got me into Mr. Beast, and he makes these pretty cool videos, and right now he is the most popular YouTuber of all the YouTubers. The twins got me into his stuff, and a large number of his videos are endurance challenges. The interesting thing is that people are obviously interested in watching stories of endurance that even the YouTubers have tapped into this. Some of the videos that this guy, Mr. Beast, has made, 40 million people watched a video where he has the last to stop pedaling a recumbent bike. The winner lasted 15 hours. 78 million people watched the video that the last to take their hand off a $300,000 Lamborghini wins the car. They had 50 people, and they all had to keep one hand on the car 24 hours a day, and it got increasingly harder. They did a bunch of different challenges, and by the end, the car was elevated above the heads of the final two contestants, and they just had one finger on there, and they lasted 60 hours. 
to win the car. 60 hours, two and a half days. There's another video watched by 102 million people. 50 hours in a maximum security prison. 145 million people watched a contest where 100 people were inside a circle and the last one to leave wins the prize. In the final 10, they went on to another contest with a chance to win a million dollars. But it took 12 days to get down to the final 10. Other videos that this guy's made about people staying in a coffin buried underground for 50 hours. Who can stay in a hot tub full of slime the longest? Who can run on the treadmill the longest? These videos get millions and millions of views. Endurance is something we celebrate and even honor in the lives of others, but do we value it in our own lives? Jacob, he was on the right path, and he found himself alone at night in a fight. Now, the Bible scholars that I checked in with this week, they're quick to point out that Jacob was an elderly man at this point, maybe as old as 97. The touch on the hip, it it doesn't appear to be a great effort from the person he's wrestling. The account we read, doesn't it doesn't sound that Jacob was physically uh, able to outfight the individual. It's kind of like when the kids want to wrestle with dad. It lasts as long as the kids can keep up. When dad says enough, it's enough. The point is that this is a match of endurance. This is a time where we see endurance from one of the heroes of the Bible. And all this, it gets Jacob ready for a blessing. And God's blessing, his promotion, it looks different than we might expect. I want to read this to you. This is something I read this week. So far, Jacob's whole life had been a continual struggle. And even his wives turned the natural act of giving birth into a struggle for supremacy. You can read that drama in Genesis 29 and 30. Now he must learn that true blessing is a gift of God. The change of name from Jacob to Israel plays an important role in this narrative. The name Jacob is a reminder that his greatest struggle is with God. The fact that Jacob limps away from the place where he has been blessed helps to put Jacob's struggles in perspective. He limps back across the brook, blessed. But the result implicit in the story and highlighted by gentle irony, you have prevailed, is that at last Yahweh has prevailed and Jacob is conquered. Jacob He'd already wrestled with Isaac. He'd already wrestled with Esau. He'd already wrestled with Laban. But he found that true blessing comes from wrestling with God. True blessing is being in step with God's plans, purposes, and timing. I've heard things before. People say things like, I'm too too blessed to be stressed. I've heard people describe that blessing is having enough or having plenty. I don't know about you, but I know plenty of people that aren't stressed, they have enough, but I wouldn't describe their lives as blessed. And maybe we need to redefine what blessed means. External, temporary things may be a true blessing, it may be provision or a gift from God, but we can only enjoy them if we're in step with God. We can only enjoy the good things in life. Truly, when we're in step with God. This was a mistake the Pharisees in the time of the New Testament made. The Pharisees looked at external things. They looked at the bank balance. And they concluded that that meant that someone was blessed, that God's approval was on them. Jesus turns up and makes sure everybody knows that's not the case. This is not the measurement of blessed. Is the stuff, is the external things. The true measurement of being blessed is being in step with God's plans, His purpose, and His timing. Now, Jacob, he was living with a promise from God. He was wealthy. He had lots of children. He had a stolen blessing from his father. He had just been blessed, if you read the story, by Laban. But was he really blessed? He didn't think so. He didn't think so. He had a family. He was living with the promises of God. He had had lots of kids. He had lots of cash. He was a farmer and had lots of livestock. He'd been blessed by his father, stolen, but still... He'd been blessed by his father-in-law, and yet still he wanted more. He knew that this wasn't the final word on blessing. He fought all night alone to get a blessing. And finally, he received a blessing. And then, and I would say only then, did he go from being wealthy and successful to blessed. He fought with God, and the transformation meant that he was in step with God's plans, purposes, and timing. And the rest of Jacob's story... It shows him as respectable and honored. Without the wrestling, living blessed wouldn't have been possible. Jacob demanded a blessing. And what he got wasn't a big check, 
What he got wasn't anything that you and I would be impressed with. What he got was a new name. We wouldn't define blessing that way. But for Jacob, it meant redefining himself. It meant redefining the future. It means addressing the past properly. In ancient culture, names have a far greater significance than they do today. If you're a parent here today, there's a fair chance that your time of picking a baby name was just like Megan and I. You say a name, the other person gets all ugly face until finally there's a name that you both are okay with. It's for the best that Megan and I don't have a fourth child because there is not a single name on the planet that we agree on except the three that we have. But we just pick a name because we like it. In ancient times, you would pick a name based on what you're projecting for the future, a descriptor of this person, what you, the circumstances around the birth. We see this in the Bible. If you know the Old Testament, you've seen this many times. There's a power in the name that we give to people. It's not like today where we like the sound of a name, so we give it to a kid. There is something in this in ancient times. So in Genesis 32, 28, there's a deep significance when it says, your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Jacob, the name, is descriptor of his character, who he was, how he went through life. He was born grabbing his twin brother's heel and that image would be defining for him, earning him the name and he lived up to it. Jacob, as a word, can also mean a supplanter, to take the place of another through force or scheming, and Jacob definitely schemed. Essentially, the name Jacob meant someone who grabs what doesn't belong to them by deception. And now he's told, this is not your name anymore. This is not who you are anymore. This is not your definition anymore. You are being redefined as Israel, which means he has fought with God. Most notably, with this wrestle in this account from Genesis 32, he's told that he won the fight, but what did he win? A busted hip? No, he's blessed with a new name. He won because he got his name redefined. He got a new name. That is winning. The fight is a new name. His past is dealt with and his future is redefined. That is winning the wrestle. If one person claps, we all have to. This is Jacob being told, you're done manipulating and scheming. Now you fight with God to receive the blessing. You now get to fight God and walk step in step with him as he cleans up the past and he opens up a future for you. A few weeks ago now, we talked about the Red Sea and the image that we have at the moment where the nation of Israel has escaped from Egypt and they're getting ready to go into the promised land and they are at the edge of the ocean. The Red Sea is in front of them and there is an army behind them. And the miracle that happens in Exodus 14 is that God not only takes care of the enemy behind them, he opens up the ocean in front of them. It is a great picture of God dealing with the past, dealing with the enemy that wants to drag you back where you just escaped from. The consequence of the past, the pain of the past, the implications of who you were, Dragging you back into slavery, being defeated by the hand of God. But also, the future is wide open for you. That God is able to bring hope. I am bringing you somewhere. It is a great picture of what happens on the cross. The account from Jacob is another one that all helps to build towards the cross of Jesus. I am changing your name. You're not going to be that person anymore. I'm destroying the Egyptian army behind you. You're getting a new name. You're not going to be the same person anymore. And not only that, I'm splitting the Red Sea in front of you so you can go through on dry ground and walk into all the promises I have. But Jacob, I'm giving you a new name, a new definition, a new set of promises, a new motivation, a new drive. You're going to be a different person after this. You are going to be redefined as a human. And Jacob lived up to it and he lived the rest of his life respectable, honored, and someone that is worth looking up to. God not only addresses the past, he also takes care of the future. The cross, which is where all this points to, the cross wins the war on two fronts the past and the future. We're rescued from the past, grafted and adopted into the promises of God for the future. He has dealt with our past and opened up a life in front of us that we cannot imagine. Here's a few New Testament verses that speak to this. 
2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Ephesians 2, God saved you by His grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. He has got a future in front of us, so we can do all the good things He has planned for us long ago. And this one from the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel. And I will give you a new heart. I will open up the ocean in front of you. I will give you a new name. I will redefine your future. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. I will take away the name Jacob. You will be done with the past. We're going to take care of the Egyptian army behind you. And I will give you a tender, responsive heart. The old life is gone. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. He has taken out our stony, stubborn hearts. Your name is no longer Jacob and a new life has begun. Now we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. God has given us a tender, responsive heart. You are now called Israel, is what Jacob was told. The army at the back has been defeated, and the ocean in front of us has been opened up. The past is dealt with, and the future is secure in Him. Now we may think of promotion as synonymous with a pay raise. But children, that's like a promotion. And that didn't come with a pay raise. They come with more responsibility, more work, but more blessing and more joy. What's the promotion that God's preparing you for? Maybe it's a new season of life. Maybe it's a big career move. Maybe it's a new opportunity for ministry, a new opportunity for your family. Maybe it's to deepen your relationship with Him. Maybe promotion is being ready to address something sinful or unhealthy in your life. Maybe finally uh, family dynamics have shifted. Maybe it's getting ready to start a new relationship. Maybe it's a significant change. But the point is that for Jacob, from this point on, he's fought, he's won, and it produced a maturing, and that maturing often precedes a promotion. Stop looking at the promotion with shallow perspectives. If we keep looking for how a promotion in God's eyes will bless us, how it will further our plans, we may miss it. Jacob got his life started on the right track. Then he had a fight. He was alone, but he persisted. And it redefined for him what a blessing was. He left that fight with a new name. He was ready to be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. He was ready to embrace the promises made to his grandfather Abraham and confirmed to his father Isaac. The scandalous cheat, liar, manipulator, coward on the run had been defeated. He returned home ready to embrace the promise that Abraham received and ready to embrace his responsibility as the father of the 12 men who would grow up to become a nation. Prepared for promotion means ready for responsibility. We just need often to keep turning up, keep persisting, keep enduring, keep doing the right things. There are some times in life where it's awesome and reading the Bible is like a fire hydrant of revelation and mind-blowing insight. And there's other times we're rereading the same passage over and over, hoping to get something. There are some times where we have moments of prayer and it's filled with thanksgiving and rejoicing. There are other times when we get together and pray and we're just begging God to change the situation we're in. There are some times where we come to church with a spring in our step and other times we turn up just hoping no one asks us how we're doing. There are some times where the kids are all in a good spot They're working hard at school, making good choices. Parenting is a joy. And there's other times where the kids are causing you to lose sleep. And we can't believe that these are the choices they've made. And we're figuring out how to show them that we love them anyway. There's sometimes turning up to work and it's fine. The people you work with aren't too bad and there's stability. And you and your spouse are relieved that we don't have to worry about finances. And other times there's a wrestle. And the boss announces that there might be layoffs and nobody knows who's going to be the first to go. And you're trying to be optimistic and strong for the family. In these moments, character gets shaped. Old promises find a new confidence. Persistence builds. Strength and hope comes. Our priorities shift. And because our priorities have shifted, our understanding of blessing changes. Yes, it's a fight. It's a lonely wrestle that's lasting all night, all alone. But the dawn comes and there's something on the other side. The regrets of the past get dealt with and left behind. And the new becomes a reality. 
God's responsibility is the promotion and the blessing. Our responsibility is to keep fighting and persisting, trusting that He's working in and through our lives. Jacob never forgot what happened that night. Verse 31, the sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. He didn't forget and he made sure others didn't forget either. He passed down to his children and consequently the whole nation of Israel what happened. Whenever they ate certain types of meat, they remember, don't eat that bit. Why not? Because of what happened to Jacob. Because what happened in the wrestle? What happened in the fight? The lessons Jacob learned that day, he understood they were so valuable that he had to pass them on. And we have to remember that you win because you don't give up. The wrestle is often the preparation that precedes a promotion. Endurance and humility are underrated. True blessing is being in step with God's plans, purposes, and timing. And the cross of Jesus wins the war on two fronts, the past and the future. Prepared for promotion means being ready for responsibility. I got a couple of questions for you. Hope you have a chance this week to write these down, pray about it, think about it, maybe talk it over with someone. Well, the first thing is this, how important is endurance and humility to you? I would say they're underrated. I would say in the world we live in, humility, endurance are underrated. How important are they to you? Humility and endurance. Second question, do you need to redefine blessing or promotion? Do you need to redefine? True blessing is being in step with God's plans, purposes, and timing. Are we settling for just having everything okay, having enough, and not having any concern about whether or not we are truly in step with God? I want to reread a portion for you. I read this from the book of Ephesians to bring about the reality that the old is dealt with and the new is wide open to us. Ephesians 2.8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. One of the things that's taught in the Bible is that Jesus is the savior of the world. That doesn't make sense until we realize we need saving. And once you realize we need saving, we want to hear news about a savior. Sin is a terrible word. It gets everybody uncomfortable. Nobody likes talking about it. Nobody likes hearing about it. It brings images to our minds of angry people pointing fingers. But we don't do anybody any favors by running from the reality that we are all in trouble. There is not a single one of us that can pretend that we have not sinned. There is not a single one of us that pretends that we can pretend with any integrity that we do not need a savior. We do, we desperately do. All of us are distant from God. All of us have done things that have pushed God away. God loves us so much that he sent his son to fix the problem that we could not fix by ourselves. That's what we just read. We can't boast about fixing our relationship with God because no matter how good our good works are, they're not good enough. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became humanity to pay the price of humanity that we could never ever pay. That's what happened on the cross. Jesus took on the sin of the world. He took on the punishment that you and I deserve so that you and I could have a healed and whole relationship with God. If you ever meet a Christian and you ask them about this, they will gladly tell you, man, when I met Jesus, things changed. When I met Jesus and I knew my relationship with God could be healed, it is the best thing that's ever happened to me. That is definitely my story. 19 years ago, I encountered the love of God in a way that I'd never expected. Wasn't looking for it, wasn't on the hunt for it, or wasn't searching. It found me and it has changed my life. In the past 19 years, they've been ups, they've been downs. But my friend, I have never once regretted my decision to follow Jesus. Not once. I want to put to you today an invitation to make the decision I made 19 years ago. The decision to put Jesus first at the absolute central spot of our lives. The Lord of Lords in your lives and follow Him. 
And I believe it is the best decision anyone can ever make. So I want to invite everyone here to close your eyes and bow your heads. Let's just give privacy and discretion to the people around you so that we can focus on what matters right now. But if this is you, if I'm talking to you, and you know that today is the day where you make this decision, I would love to pray for you. I promise I won't embarrass you. I won't do anything that's going to make you regret this when the drive home. But if this is you today, could you just put your hand up just so I know who we're praying for when we pray in a moment? Awesome. Wonderful. Anyone else here? I promise I won't embarrass you, but I'd love to know who I'm praying for when we pray in a moment. Wonderful. If you're at home, you can just push the button that says, I raise my hand. Anybody else here when we pray? Amen. Come on, Word of Life. Let's celebrate with people making the best decision we could ever make. Amen. Well, we're going to pray a prayer together. We do this at the end of every service. The words are on the screen. I invite everyone to pray along, believing that this has the power to change lives today. So come on, everybody. Lord Jesus. I believe you died for me. I want to follow you. I invite you to be Lord of my life. Help me follow you every day. I want to leave my old life of sin behind and heal my broken relationship with God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, one more time, everybody. Let's celebrate with everybody. Amen.